Good morning. I'm Lauren Deeg. I'm Associate Professor of Urban Planning, coming to you from the home studio. Today we're going to talk a little bit about color theory, color taxonomy, practical uses of color, observations of color schemes, and a little bit about our next project unit phase. All right, we're going to cover some different color principles, uh, different theories, and uh, a lot of, from a lot of different sources and authors talk about color taxonomy, how we, uh, some of the words and terms that we use to describe color, and then look at how a couple of different practitioners have used it and wrap it up here with a kind of an introduction to your next phase of Unit 2. Interestingly enough, it's, art history has been complicated for some of us who are a little bit older and uh, to the point where uh, even some aspects of our art history education in our art, art history books didn't even contain color. And so it's amazing. Looking back at uh, someone of my age or older, uh, thinking about uh, that perhaps, you know, uh, some of the great paintings that we evaluated and learned about didn't, weren't even printed in color. <laughs> In some cases, uh, of course, today's internet and information age, we have broad access and, and wide access to a lot of different artworks. But uh, this comparison here uh, for the self-portrait of Henri, Henri Matisse, you can definitely see uh, a clear distinction between the black and white reproduction of the painting as well as uh, the color reproduction. The contrast and the uh, schemes and the color choices are, are quite different uh, in terms of how it was originally uh, processed or uh, reproduced. A little bit about some of the psychology of color, uh, how it affects who we are as as uh, as members of the mammal family and as members of the human family. I think there's uh, some some interesting ties to uh, the the harshness or the uh, group groupings of colors that have to start to suggest uh, hospitality or non hospitable environments. Uh, we we often associate colors with with uh, places or environments that are more hospitable to us, uh, and associate colors and tints and shades with uh, areas that are not hospitable to us. And so, uh, the psychology of color has a lot to do with uh, our fight or flight uh, instincts as well as our ability to survive as a species. Interactions with other species, such as this murder hornet here. Uh, uh, color has an effect, perhaps, of, of uh, suggesting that uh, uh, there's there's a possibility that they may harm us. In other places, uh, uh, the psychology of color perhaps is a little more accommodating. In terms of what might be healthy for us or not healthy for us, bright colors, we often associate bright and healthy colors with things that we can consume and the lack of color or the absence of color with things that are not, or in some cases a poisonous tree frog. Still, again, the, when something is contrasting from its existing environment, this 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 uh, oasis, whether this is a real real place or if this is a Photoshop composite, uh, uh, sometimes the groupings or balance of color have a have a suggestion of again of our survival versus our lack of survival. Groupings of colors don't always suggest the same thing. Uh, warm colors may suggest a negative or a positive, or in many cases, a disaster. So our brain has to sift through all of that and understand it. But, uh, but uh, in terms of how we're programmed, we are associating, we associate different aspects of, of, of pleasure or, or, or fright or uh, different emotions with colors. Key reminder here is that we 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 often think that we might see with our eyes. We actually see with our brain. The eyes are just tools that that uh, transmit that, that 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 process light and translate it on the retina into uh, nerve signals that the brain can understand. So it's important to remember that we actually see with our brain, and it's important too to understand how light is processed by the retina and the importance of the retina the cell structure of the retina, and how these different cells perceive different wavelengths of light. Um, just important to remember that. And uh, that the eye itself is just an amazing, uh, uh, an amazing system uh, by itself in terms of how uh, 
um, light is transmitted uh, through through the eye and then uh, processed by uh, the cells in the retina. And those photosensors that uh, that process the light into opt optic uh, into optic signals the brain can see. Also remember that we only see a very narrow wavelength. Um, uh, mammals in particular, uh, but other, other animals see different wavelengths. Uh, very important to remember. But why bananas appear yellow is not because they are absorbing that color, it's because they are reflecting that particular wavelength, that there are aspects of molecular uh, composition of the banana that actually are reflecting yellow wavelength light back into our eyes. Not absorbing, it's reflecting that. So that's important to remember, a good concept to remember as we move forward into the next unit. All colors are just variations of the wavelength light along the spectrum of light for some animals. And other animals, like birds, actually see more colors than we do. So that's important. It's important too to remember that this narrow wavelength exists in the, in the, in the spectrum between X-rays, ultraviolet, and infrared. Uh, in below microwave, FNM, and long radio waves, but that the visual spectrum is, is only a very narrow slice of that. So it puts into context a lot of the things we, uh, uh, that light actually is. Again, back to some of the psychological associations with color and medieval Europe, uh, there, there were um, some key concepts connected with color, and you see that reflected in popular culture, or, or you see it reflected particularly in the art. Perhaps not in Monty Python in this case, but uh, or perhaps so. Um, but uh, we often do associate uh, either the absence of color or the specific color groups um, uh, with 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 great virtues or with great ideas here. And this differs across different world cultures. Very important to remember that the Surrealists had their own color code, was uh, just as a, as a contrast to that. Uh, and so uh, the color coding of surrealist paintings and surrealist artwork was dealing with some deeper meaning and some deeper psychology. These slides are from uh, Jeremy, and uh, it is, it is, it's good to sort of know where different pigments or different paints come from and how they pass from cultures to, uh, to culture. Some of the great cave paintings of Western Europe are uh, come directly from the iron that's contained in iron-rich soils, and so that rusty red-brown color is associated with iron. It's also where brick color comes from, is from iron-rich soil. Orange, in order to make a more poignant orange, uh, uh, actually created and needed a different process, and some, some of these uh, chemicals were in fact toxic, and either came from came from uh, other toxic chemicals like lead, which a lot of paint uh, contains lead uh, throughout most of the 19th to 20th century, still still has a uh, very important pigment and, and property. Uh, some come from animal processes or animal, uh, animal products or byproducts. Blue is often associated with royalty, virtue, or holiness, and that's because Blue was one of the most expensive colors to paint. The pigment uh, containing that ma makes up blue had to be imported. So it has a, has a connection to history and global trade. Other painters started to assign meanings just like, as the Surrealists did. Purple too is associated with royalty and, and in particular in Western Europe. And again, because of the expense of the process in order to make that particular color. Purple also has connections and indigo connections to Persia. Lapis lazuli is, is one particular uh, material that was imported along the Silk Road that allowed uh, for more expressive colors into the blues and violets and indigos. Brown, associated with the earth perhaps, uh, uh, became, became associated with lower classes. Black, coming from uh, burning or ash making it for an intense black, so often associated with fire burning, and different processes to make, make it more pure black. Your associations with lead. In the 20th century, uh, 
color psychology became more scientific and particularly of interest to architects, artists, and uh, interior designers as the psychology of color started to become associated with how folks behaved in the built environment and particularly interior environments. And so a lot of, a lot of psychologists and artists started to become very interested in how those uh, started to come together. Of course, we understand them as, as pigment colors. Uh, if we think about pigment, all, all colors are made up of some combination of, of, of red, yellow, and blue, and we understand that the primary colors are, are ingredients in secondary colors as we start to divide them into taxonomies. Tertiary colors are mid-ranges in between the secondary colors, and we often hyphenate those as they are in between. So if we look at the basic wheel of a pigment color wheel, and I emphasize this because this is how we often mix colors of, uh, for pigment, for uh, trans, translucent and for opaque material, uh, we have a taxonomy that has us beginning with the red, the blue, and the yellow, and then all the colors in between that we typically call the secondary and tertiary colors. For paint, when you start to mix them and overlap them, everything comes together in sort of a muddy, muddy, dark gray or even black. And that's important uh, for, for, for opaque media and translucent media that involves pigments. The mixing of these colors tends to make them darker and tends to uh, have the overlap tends to get us into a very dark region indeed. If we look at this historic color wheel from Windsor Newton, which is a manufacturer of watercolor, a translucent medium, uh, we can see that the, uh, the thickness and application of the pigment uh, can be adjusted from, from very intense to less intense. It too follows a mixing regimen that involves uh, uh, perhaps a, a, a clear distinction of, of the primary colors as the basic ingredients. Faber Biren, probably one of my favorite authors who really did get into the nitty gritty of psychology of color and, and made re clear recommendations for architects and interior designers to think about different colors, materials, and paints for psych psychological reasons, uh, followed that uh, uh, consistently. But again, for pigment colors, uh, this, this taxonomy of, of, the, of the pure primary colors, secondary colors, and tertiary colors is consistent. Johannes Itten was a faculty member at the Bauhaus. His color wheel looks a little bit different because he's concentrating on, on a range of shade and tint and shade from pure white all the way to pure black. And so he saw the color wheel as needing to express different levels of tint and shade from very thin color to very thick color. So his color wheel looks a little bit different as he's incorporating tint and shade. For folks who work in film and video and in lighting in particular, the color wheel probably looks a little bit different. They're not dealing with additive pigment color. They're dealing with uh, different colors of light and how they layer together and how they interact. And, and for them, the primary colors are red, green, and blue in terms of lighting. And then when those all mix, they, they form pure white light. So a color wheel for a videographer, a cinematographer, a lighting designer, um, for someone associated with video and film uh, is a little bit different. It involves cyan, it involves magenta. And so uh, uh, color wheels do uh, change for depending on who is working with uh, color in that particular, uh, particular area. But for us, uh, the primary colors are red, 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 yellow, and blue. The secondary colors and the tertiary colors uh, kind of fall into place in terms of the traditional color wheel for pigment. One dynamic uh, that's important to remember is, is the idea of the complementary colors, that kind of colors that are opposite of each other on the color wheel. So if we look at the color wheel and we look across uh, the different classifications, when, when we look at a pair of complements or color complements or if colors are complementary, they are in fact opposite of each other in the color wheel. And it is spelled this way. The, 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 to give someone a complement is in fact spelled with an I. In the term of, of things that are opposites that complement each other, it is spelled with an E. So do 
Uh, note that distinction of spelling as well as dictionary meaning. When we refer to colors that are close to each other or adjacent to each other on the color wheel, we, we refer to them as analogous, analogous colors. Johannes Itten in particular refers to them as analogous. Faber Baron calls them adjacent colors. So analogous uh, do connect the word analogous and adjacent together when you're referring to groups of colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. The word hue is perhaps one of some of the most misused words when it comes to color. Hue refers to the category or taxonomy of color. We would refer to this as red, we would refer to this as yellow, we refer to this as green, we refer to this as blue. It's basically the name. Okay, so, so some folks misassociate hue with the color intensity when in fact when we refer to a color's hue we're referring to the name that we associate with this particular wavelength. What folks often mischaracterize as hue is chroma. Uh, high chroma colors are very shiny or very vivid colors. Low chroma colors are almost achromatic or have almost no hue associated with them. So what we refer to less intensity of, of color. Constant chroma, these four colors arguably uh, have the same chroma less intensity than these four up here, uh, but they have similar vividness despite differences of hue or less purity in the top image. So when referred to intensity or vividness of color, the word we associate with that is chroma. Saturation, these four colors arguably have the same intensity, even though they are different hues, they could even be grouped together in that way. And then saturation contrast, if we go from this magenta to this darker purple, uh, they have various levels of fullness, but they are in fact still the same hue. We could argue that these are all variations of purple or pink or magenta. Value, low value, constant, but the same brightness level. And I'd refer to the idea of adding white to a color. Um, these, these arguably are the same, similar value. These are contrasts of value, so from from this light gray to this darker gray. Contrast of value uh, leads to stark differences in, in brightness, and so that starts to lead into uh, some different ways of approaching, approaching how colors are grouped. Faber Baron referred to this as tint, tone, and shade. Going from pure white to pure black to the purest intensity of color to add white to something meant to add tint to it, it to leads towards uh, dark, darker uh, shades of something meant to add shade to it. If you're using a, sim a, a combination of gray and white, you refer to the tone. So, so it's interesting here as one considers the dynamic between a pure color, a gray uh, state, a white state or a black state, to go from pure color to white mean, means to add tint, to go from pure color to black means to add shade, and to consider gray, to add gray to something is to tone it. So this, this wheel here I think is very helpful in terms of understanding how we approach um, these terms of tint, shade, and tone. So examples of tint, tones, and shades. So tint, to tint a color is to add white to a pure hue, and this is true when you, when you go to a paint store. To add shade, to add black to a pure hue, uh, is, is to make it darker with, with black, and to tone it is to add gray to it. So that hopefully clarifies uh, these terms for us. Johannes Hinton was also very interested in how people perceived color, and he started to do lots of experiments and setups in which colors were, in fact, uh, uh, perceived differently, largely by which uh, colors um, surrounded a particular color. So, so Itten, in particular, in some of these experiments, argues that these two uh, green squares are, in fact, the same color. Now, I could argue, it looks very different when it's surrounded by these, these particular surroundings. And in fact, it looks very different. Uh, I, I would argue myself, looking at it myself, that these two 
greens are not the same green, but in fact they are. Similarly, when we look at this uh, contrast of, of this X here in the gray and this X in the yellow, they look like very, very, very different X's, but in fact, we can prove that they are in fact the same color. So as you look from one side to the other, it's like, wow, you know, the, con the, the context in which a color exists can lead to its perception. And you can join the, these two things together and you go, oh my goodness, wow. So the context in which a color exists has a lot to do with its perception. So some of the experiments and diagrams and exercises and uh, artwork that Itten was dealing with at the Bauhaus was dealing with, with some of the, some of the um, interesting perceptions of things. Filmmakers do this all the time. Uh, when adding a, or layering a color over a scene, they are uh, intensifying uh, the colors in it. So uh, if you were to look, for instance, in this example at Lawrence Fishburne's skin tone, it, it, it is, it is uh, something along the gray-green, uh, very different than his natural skin tone. And so uh, all of the, uh, the green added to this particular scene in the Matrix um, Matrix Revolutions um, uh, affects its overall perception and psychology. One great instance of the uh, in internet history was the infamous dress. Uh, some folks saw it as a, uh, uh, a blue and brown dress, others saw it as white and gold, and we can see that they're pretty close to the same color. What, what really affected it is its perception was was its in fact its surroundings and folks continue to argue about this particular dress to this day in terms of, of, of how they perceive the colors. Color grouping, color schemes, uh, color layering, lighting, color choices, uh, deliberate choice here to go with a yellow dress in order to to be to serve as the color complement to the uh, cool colors that were uh, seen in the scene here. We've got light reflecting off the asphalt from a source. We've got a Los Angeles sunset and the San Gabriel Mountains. So some deliberate choices here for, for, uh, uh, for wardrobe here uh, in order for the dress to stand out as a color complement. So these choices and these uh, ideas are explored in film constantly. More experiments from Itten. This gray square is supposedly the same across all of these. There may be some change in the reproduction here, you know, as we go from slide and into PowerPoint. But uh, arguably, arguably, Itten would, would start to test and prove that uh, the same uh, value of gray would be seen differently depending on what was surrounding it. Similarly, with this blue frame against black or against yellow, the perception of that blue is different uh, depending on how what surrounds it. Michael Doyle also experimented with some of these things in the spirit of Itten. That size also had a, a matter of, of perception. Color contrasts. Itten also started to develop a lot of color schemes that were based on contrasts, what, uh, what is called a complementary extension. The idea that a small percentage of a hot or warm color contrasting with a cool color would achieve balance is something that Itten was really working on as he was developing some of his color schemes. He argued that um, that some colors were best balanced when they were 50-50, but he, he uh, found that uh, instances of, of yellow versus purple were balanced when in fact they were perhaps only 20-80. Uh, uh, or in this case of the blue and the orange is probably 30-70. So as he was grouping colors and developing schemes, he found that complementary extensions were quite interesting because uh, a little bit of this goes a pretty long way. And so uh, we, 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 we observe those in the built environment and in, uh, in art and interior design and in materials. It's then started to create some categories of color grouping. So contrast by saturation, contrast of light and dark, contrast of extension, contrast of color complements, using these previous terms, simultaneous contrast, contrast of hue in primaries or in other groupings, contrast of warm and cool. So Itten started to develop and started to list 
a number of important and helpful color schemes in his work uh, based on these different contrasts. Faber Baron, our other friend, uh, uh, also started to create some color schemes that, that were recommended for architects and interior designers using slightly different terms. He, instead of using complement, he used the word opposite. Instead of analogous, he used the word adjacent. So he started to develop these diagrams to, as helpful reminders of how to start to create color schemes and color groupings. He also started to, to look at ideas of split complementary pairs, the idea that one color on one side of the wheel would, could be grouped with two other colors on the opposite side. So this is what we call a split complementary. Two colors on one side, one color on the other. Used a lot in architecture and interior design. Other uh, uh, schemes, triads, three colors that were balanced against each other on the wheel in the form of a triangle of some kind, uh, also appeared uh, in artwork, architecture, and interior design. So if we look at some of those, we see them in nature, this balance between uh, browns and blue sky, in sunsets, in artwork, an analogous scheme versus a complementary scheme, more artwork, triads, the groupings of colors against black and white, more sophisticated groupings of greens uh, against browns, simple color complements of, of bright and warm colors against a cool field. In retail, we see color schemes a lot because the color psychology has to do with the buyer's experience and with marketing. And so one of my favorite examples is just looking at the color schemes of different Starbucks, that they often are a split complementary pair between the greens and the browns, all these different wonderful earth tones that we associate with the color of the product the color of a latte, the color of a cappuccino, or the color of, of roasted coffee beans or espresso. The green serves as a complement to all of those wonderful browns and tans and beiges, often seen across the architecture and interior design of, of Starbucks coffee locations. So the green serves a couple of purposes. Green perhaps refers to the unroasted coffee bean, which is green when it's harvested and separated um, uh, from, from, uh, from, the, 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 from the plant itself. Um, but it also serves uh, exquisitely as a clear color contrast against all the other colors chosen, perhaps representing the product itself. So you often see a split complementary scheme in Starbucks coffee. Practitioners in architectural rendering and watercolor, some of the uh, folks uh, from the Rena Renaissance and Beaux-Arts era often set up very clear schemes uh, with split complementary pairs, subtle blues and purples against the browns and tans. And in my work, uh, we, often, uh, we often have interesting balances uh, or split complementary pairs uh, of uh, contrasts of warm and cool. For this interior design proposal for this retirement home, I'm using uh, a combination of earth tones and browns against uh, uh, some intense purples and greens. One spotlight, uh, one practitioner that I followed uh, growing up in Northern Michigan uh, was uh, someone by the name of Alden B. Dow, who uh, trained uh, classically at Columbia University and then uh, later studied under Frank Lloyd Wright for a brief time, came back to northern Michigan after only six months with Frank Lloyd Wright and built uh, a considerable number of buildings and projects across northern Michigan. He also practiced uh, uh, landscape architecture. Landscape architecture was not a licensed profession in Michigan until 1980. But um, his buildings, about three, three, four hundred buildings across Michigan, North Carolina, Arizona, and, uh, and the south, were, were, were interesting because of his, prime, his, his use of primary and secondary colors 
And he used, used those colors to divide spaces, to, to indicate their function, to, uh, to, create, to create stimuli or, or contrast with the, with the out exterior or the landscape. Uh, and, and he stressed the use of opposites because the physiology of the eye dictates the balanced use of several rather than a single color. Too much of any one color upsets the human equilibrium. So he has a, he, he has a particular philosophy here of how uh, using really bright contrasts of color um, uh, had, had to do with, with the psychology of the human equilibrium. Very interesting um, uh, connections that he starts to make between material color, paint color, uh, and the landscape itself. This is his home and studio in Midland, Michigan. It is Part of it is submerged against this pond and is part now of the Dow Gardens Complex, a series of, of, of themed gardens that he designed as well around his home and studio. And this is known as the Submariner Room because half of the room is, is submerged into this pond. The influence uh, from Frank Lloyd Wright is, is potent and noticeable. I only spent six months with Frank Lloyd Wright at the Taliesin Fellowship, but did learn quite a bit. Uh, but, and, but, and also gleaned uh, from Frank Lloyd Wright and from perhaps from his uh, travels a lot of Eastern influence, Japanese influence and Chinese influence into, uh, into color, materiality, and uh, this in exquisite sort of balance between inside and outside, between built and nature. Interestingly enough, Dow applied color theory and principles even into uh, his, uh, his renderings and drawings that he prepared for the different uh, uh, different commissions that he had. Uh, you can see um, a, a mixture of tans and yellows and grays, uh, soft grays to depict the flooring here, but then uses a bright red or brick red here um, for the poche of the walls itself makes the plan very readable from a distance. And so very interesting that Dow applied color theory not only into the uh, interior design of these uh, buildings, but also uh, in the rendering itself. Application of warm and cool and uh, even, even down into the, into the selection of fabrics for furniture, uh, carpet, and even pillows. So a little bit further experimentation or use of color than Frank Lloyd Wright did. Wright would probably uh, use more, more earth tones in this case. Dow is pushing the palette a little bit with, by introducing more cool colors. Carpet, um, wall covering, plaster, and flooring all, all taking on this very vivid uh, composition of primary and secondary colors, and also uh, wall wall coverings and, and carpet, as I mentioned. Here's the home and studio again. This is uh, Dow's personal desk, and so we can see leading up into this clear story light several layers or levels of of color, which are in fact uh, paint, but but it makes it makes the space seem like more complex than it really is. And again, he's balancing and, and psychologically argued that uh, that the human human eye and the human brain needed exposure to more colors than just just a, a singular dominant color. This auditorium, the Civic Auditorium in Midland, one which a lot of folks in, in Central and Mid Michigan know very well, uh, is an abstraction of a forest. So the color schemes um, and contrast between. Uh, between the greens and these uh, vivid uh, red, oranges, reds, oranges, and yellows are intended to evoke the uh, abstraction or the symbolism of, of, of being outside. The Dow Gardens complex, which surrounds the home and studio and is adjacent to that particular civic auditorium, lots of interesting influences, again, both from Frank Lloyd Wright and from Eastern influence. Uh, the idea that, that, uh, that Red steel contrasts very conveniently against the green of summer and spring, but also contrasts with with the grays and and uh, whites and blacks of winter. And so, that wisdom of of being able to coexist in nature and to be visible and be noticed in in across the four seasons very important in Mid Michigan, uh, but but lots of interesting influence and parallels to Japanese. Uh, design architecture and landscape architecture in which red and vermilion and orange are a big part because of their compatibility with the four seasons. <laughs>
onto your work. So we're, we're completing phase one, which uh, involves uh, some careful study of light and pattern and mood and perspective and learning lots of interesting things in terms of how light behaves on its way into a space. Important um, uh, real world application of that knowledge and these things that we're learning uh, involve, involve the need to control solar radiation in, 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 in different climates. So here's a diagram from this particular uh, designer. You can follow them on Instagram. Um, reminding us of some of the key architectural elements that we use to control solar radiation. So be exploring and thinking about these real world applications as you continue to study the, the behavior of light as it enters this cube. One thing I think is distinctive too now is to understand how color can project into a space. So this is in my, my apartment here in Muncie. Uh, bright, bright sunlight is bouncing off of a warm wood floor and projecting this color onto the plaster ceiling. So this has quite a, quite a bit of uh, influence in the psychology of the space. It makes the space feel considerably warmer and have a very, uh, very uh, comforting mood. So the idea that light can bounce off of a surface and project a color onto a surface, I think is an interesting way of looking at this. So if we try that, here's, here's a, an orange cube that I have as part of my office uh, set up, and we can see the color projecting onto a white piece of paper. Reflecting light, reflecting off of this color and then projecting it onto a surface. If it's a translucent material or transparent material, of course, light passes through it and projects it onto a surface as well. So we can start to experiment with opaque material and with translucent or transparent materials in terms of how we might project and, and play with light. Here's a combination of the two. And here's some other materials. These are transparent films or transparents uh, uh, cellophane or acetate. Uh, th this in particular can be found at a craft store or a dollar store. It's the same stuff that we use to wrap up candy or wrap up snacks or lollipops or cake pops. So it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's acetate film uh, that comes in different colors that we can start to experiment with. You could also find other office supplies like book report covers and protective covers in an office supply store that would have, have these different colors that you can start to layer on and start to perceive how these different layerings of things start to lead to the perception of different colors. You can apply them to surfaces too and just experiment to look at how these different things start to mix and how we perceive them. Layer it on top of things and find out what color, kind of color mixing starts to occur. For some of you, this next phase is a revision or reworking of your phase one cube. For others, it might be a second cube. Uh, either way, your instructor uh, will specify that in the problem statement that they release to you. And there may be opportunities to switch out or try out different things if you start to think about panels that might be projected panels or parts of this model that you could swap in and out using construction paper, using colored acetate, or our transparent film, you can see some different conditions that can be modeled and swapped out with the box or with the cube. There is a color cube, this little guy down, uh, down here, uh, which also becomes part of the perception and recording of this particular phase of the project. So the color cube is, is uh, a six-sided cube of different colors that allows us to, to see how different colored light behaves on a colored surface. Kind of a form of testing, if you will. Photography will continue of, of the cube and then uh, a, a rendering of the cube using colored pencils, a rich layered rendering practice here that we'll learn quite a lot about our, our medium and so some examples here from past years. Note the presence of the color cube in there. Here's how you make the color cube. This is a GIF that we will release 
to you as instructors. So we make the colored cube with cardstock. This gift was made by Richard Tursky, one of our colleagues. So you follow a tab and tab and slot approach to building the cube. Take different pieces of construction paper and apply them to the six sides. Richard, of course, being a very careful crafter, forming this color cube. Contains all of the primary colors and secondary colors. You may consider also another object to be part of that. Richard, as you can see, was a fan of loaded ducks. Okay, thank you very much. Please refer to your problem statement and to your instructor for further questions.